everybody, I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold, here with our weekly lecture series. This series, uh, the lecture today, is going to be on South African players, players from South Africa, the best players. And we want to thank our sponsor, Christopher Purgage, for sponsoring the lecture. If you want to sponsor a lecture, then email my wife, Karen, at atlchessclub.com, and you can sponsor a lecture too. So uh, I knew I was giving a lecture today, so I got all pretty. I'm all, you know, shave and haircut and everything. You know, not shave, but a beard trim. So I had professionally done, so I, I look so good, it may be hard for you to focus on the board when you're just staring at me so lovingly. So you'll have to do your best and try to look at the board. Okay, so, uh, there's two players in South Africa that I've heard of for many years, and we're going to look at their games. There's a third guy that was mentioned by our sponsor who I haven't heard of, but he's the second highest rated player in South Africa, so that'll show me. Okay, first guy I've heard of, and this is the guy that I know the most. I've seen his name for like 30 years. His name is Watsu Kobese, and the reason I know who he is is because uh, he's like my age. He's 50 and I'm 54. So when he was, you know, getting good or being good, that was like me too. Um, he's won the South African Close Championship three times and the South African Open twice. And he's an international master. And he's played for South Africa in many, many, many chess Olympiads. That's where I know his name from. Uh, I can't even count how many he's played in. It's, it's more than 10. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of his games to start. This is his most famous game, his most famous victim. Uh, this is Watsu Kobese versus Peter Laco. And this was in the FIDE World Championship knockout in 2001. So let's see. Laco must be in his late 40s. He's probably a couple years younger than Watsu Kobese. And 23 years ago, eh, this is pretty close to Peter Laco's prime, 2739 FIDE. So, and this was in the FIDE World Championship knockout. So, uh, Peter's trying as hard as he can, but next time he better try harder. Okay, so Watsu is white, and he plays very aggressively, except here he played the move D3. So he sort of tricked Peter by playing very solid at the beginning, then getting aggressive later. Which a lot of people do who are aggressive players. This is a Carol Khan. This is one of the main lines. I know that White can also play uh, D4 in this position. That's a move. But he played Bishop E2. And this is like um, a reversed, you know, uh, not Old Indian, but a reversed Philidor. Although typically in the Philidor, this knight would be here. And also the colors would be reversed. But this is the kind of pawn structure that you get if you play the old Indian or the Philidor, except he's doing it with white. So he's not playing for an advantage right away. He's just getting the game going and taking Peter Laco out of his prep. Peter Laco might be the best prep player in the world in 2001. Sorry about that, Kasparov. Okay. A4, A5, very positional game. Rook E1, Knight D7, always play Bishop F1, H6, Queen C2. Nobody's doing anything. Knight F8, B3, Knight G6, Bishop B2. And white is really playing like a, like a Philidor, except he has white. But the, all these moves that are being played are very similar to Philidor, uh, ideas for, for black, just that Watsu has the white pieces. Okay, so finally a pawn gets exchanged. D takes E4, D takes E4, Bishop C5. The bishop obviously did its job on D6 of defending the E pawn. Now the bishop has, you know, greener pastures. And the reason I say they're greener pastures is the arrow is green. Okay, H3 stopping Knight G4. Knight h5, Laco's eyeing the f4 square. 
Bishop a3, trying to trade off the dark squared bishops. Leiko says, that's a good idea, let's do that. Knight f4, king h2. And king h2 is a typical idea in double king pawn openings when your opponent has a knight on f4, f5. If the knight was on f5, then, then king h7. And the idea is you want to play g3 and kick the knight out, but you have to defend your h pawn. And well, Leiko seems like he has a nice position. This rook seems misplaced. And well, white's pretty passive. Okay, queen f6, attacking, rook back to a1. I was complaining about the rook on a3, so okay. Bishop d7, developing his bishop. Rook e3, defending the third rank, preparing himself for g3. b5 and g3. The knight goes back to e6. And white plays rook d3. So this weird kind of middle game strategy White plays rook takes a3, then goes back to a1, then he plays rook e3, rook d3. Very unusual. And now the bishop on d7 is under attack. So knight c5 attacks the rook and defends the bishop. And I didn't realize Watsu Kobese was a big fan of my stream, but he always sacks the exchange. Bam. Okay, is white better? I don't know. This is a very interesting exchange sacrifice because white gets all the white squares and black has nothing on the king's side. So I think the exchange sacrifice gives white a reasonable game. And as the game shows, it's very hard to play black. Okay, he played knight e7 since the knight on g6 isn't doing anything. King g2, that defends his knight more so his knight can move later, his other knight. Rook b8. Takes, knight takes, bishop c4. So white's down the exchange for a pawn. White has a pass c pawn, which isn't dangerous. White has this beautiful bishop. So I don't know, I, I guess white has, if I, I didn't look at the engine, so I gotta give you my own personal opinion. I think it's about equal. And, and the reason is I don't see a lot of good squares for the black knights. They don't seem to like to be able to come in anywhere because white has these three pawns defending like every square. Okay, so Leiko must have heard me, played rook c8, trying to get his rook on this same file as the queen. Queen d3, attacking the knight, and knight b6. Leiko knew that his knights weren't good, so he wants to take the bishop. Kobese says, nope, you're not taking my bishop. Knight b7, and c4. So typically, you don't want to give up the d4 square because black's going to put a knight there. But white has such domination of d5, white's going to try to put a knight there and definitely have the better game. Laco played knight g6. Now, I'm not as good as Peter Laco, so it could be what I'm about to say is crazy, but that seems like a terrible move to me. So I don't know why he played knight g6. And it could be... He wanted to play knight f8, knight e6, knight d4. It could be. Um, but he could have played knight c6 to go to d4. And I guess he was worried the bishop would take. But I, it's hard to buy that. So I don't really understand knight g6. Okay, queen c3. And now we're putting pressure on these two pawns. So if the knight does go to f8 and plays the long thing that I was talking about, the e5 pawn would be not defended properly. Queen d8, always retreat. Knight f1, a, a, a ridiculous blunder would be to trade here and then lose your knight on d2. Frankly, ridiculous. So white plays knight f1, and now you can do the aforementioned knight maneuver to d5. Queen c7, that doesn't really do anything. Knight e3. Rook a7. Aleko can't find anything to do. h4, put it in h. He stops h5 by playing h5 himself. Queen e1. So in this position, you know, the c pawn is pinned if he wants to play knight d5. So he puts his queen on e1. That way it's still eyeing the a5 pawn and he's not in this pin here. There's no hurry to play knight d5. Black can't stop it. 
Rook a8, it looks like Leiko wants to play a4. He can't think of anything else to do. Knight d5, queen c5, queen e2, f6, never play f6. Rook d1, and it seems impossible for black to play a4 because white plays b4 attacking the queen and has the two connected pass pawns. Also, I could take the knight on b6 and then take this pawn for free. So white has two good options against a4. That's why Leiko put his rooks on the, seventh, on the a file, was he wanted to play a4, but he can't. Okay, knight f8, here comes the knight coming to d4. Knight e1, he's going to kick the queen out with knight d3. And knight takes d5. I don't like knight takes d5. I don't like giving white these two pass pawns. Now we have pass c and d pawns. H pawn is weak. And the rooks... Why is a rook better than a minor piece when the rooks are there? The rooks have no open files. They can't do anything. So white's down in exchange but it looks like white's bishop is better than one of black's rooks, and white has two connected pass pawns, and white's a pawn up. So I'm definitely taking white here. g6, defending his h pawn. Knight d3, kicking the queen away. Knight b2, we can't play c5 yet, because our bishop would be hanging. Knight b2, he wants to play knight a4, and he did. Now he's threatening c5. Rook c7, Leiko's ready to sack the exchange back after c5, but Watsu Kobesi says, no, 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 I want to play c5. No sacking the exchange for you. And then rook c8. And that's really pathetic that the rooks are doing one thing. They're stopping c5. That's all they're doing. Terrible. Knight c3, obviously white wants to play knight e4. f5, stopping knight e4. Knight back to a4. Now that the e pawn is weaker, knight h7 is going to f6, queen c3 attacking the very weak a pawn, and we can't really defend it with a rook because c5 would be winning, and we can't defend it any other way, so he played f4 and tried to get counterplay against the white king. Now Kobesi has three connected pass pawns, trade on g3, rook f7, here comes the Leiko attack. Queen a6, Kobesi says, let's go into an end game, and then I have three connected pass pawns, and my king is safe. And Leiko says, nope. Queen f8, threatening rook f2 check. Queen e6, pinning the rook. Queen's really good on e6. Can't play rook e8, because the bishop stops it. Can't play rook e7, because it's pinned. And you can't move the knight to g5, because that's covered. So you can't attack the white queen. Good square for the white queen. Knight f6, rook f1, king g7 breaking the pin, d6, rook d8, c5, e4, knight c3, and obviously black's lost here. He's trying with his passed pawn, but trying is the first step to failure. Okay, now he's just not resigning. And after c6, he's like, okay, okay. Last seven moves or so were just silly. And here Black resigned. So amazing, uh, Watsu Kobese, whose FIDE rating was only 2396. And you might say only, well, I'm comparing him to his opponent. Very famous, almost world champion, Peter Leiko. Uh, he beat him like by just outplaying him, sacking material, pushing his past pawns. It looked like White was the better player. And this was in a very important tournament. So that's a shocking upset in, in that event. And that was in the FIDE World Championship knockout in 2001. Okay, we have another game by Kobese because um, I saw he beat another super GM. This was in the Olympiad in Istanbul in 2012. And typically, if you have a player who's the best player in their country or the most famous or one of the best. And it's not a country that has like GM after GM, like the U.S. and China, uh, France, England. They have lots of GMs. 
Some countries have zero or one GM. And South Africa has one GM. We're going to get to him later. So in those instances, they have a better chance of playing a super GM than somebody like me would. Because I'm not invited to super GM tournaments, but they can play in a tournament that I can't play in. And that tournament is the Olympiad, and they have it every two years. So every two years, the best players in their countries, 2,200, 2,300, 2,400, a lot of countries like that, they go to the Olympiad and they play super famous players. So Watsu Kobese is probably board one in 2012. And when I say probably, he definitely is because he's playing Kirill Georgiev. Kirill Georgiev, 2682 FIDE. And so in the FIDE World Cup knockout, he played Leiko. In the Olympiad, he played Kirill Georgiev, very famous players, and he was able to beat them. Okay, e4 again. Knight f6. If you like the Alakine, you might not like this game because black didn't win. Knight f3. Bishop c4. Very unusual way of playing for white. It seems like he likes to take his opponent out of preparation. Knight b6. Bishop b3. Knight c6. Queen e2. Very unorthodox play from, from white. Bishop f5. A4, threatening A5, E6, A5, as predicted, Knight D7, A6. So you won't see this kind of game in any opening manuals. White's playing his own way, taking black out of his prep, and trying to get a position where his opponent didn't out-prep him, because typically 26 and 2700 players have better preparation than 23, 2400 players. So if you play something a little odd, then they gotta play their own chess really early in the game. B6, bishop a4, knight takes e5, knight takes e5, pawn takes, and queen takes e5. The knight is pinned, so white gets his pawn back. Now Georgiev plays a nasty trick. Bishop takes c2. The pawn looks like it was defended by the bishop, but it's not, because the queen would be hanging. We need that bishop on that diagonal, so our queen, we don't lose our queen. So bishop c6, he keeps the bishop on the diagonal. He's not threatening bishop takes rook, because, again, the queen would be hanging. Bishop back to f5, knight c3, white's a pawn down. f6, never play f6, and I, I guess... If Georgiev played the very natural bishop d6, then queen takes g7. And if we play queen f6, queen takes c7. So it's hard to kick the queen out, although f6 kicks the queen out. But it weakens white's king, uh, black's king a lot. Queen e2, king f7. And, you know, white's a pawn down and has very good compensation. And in this position, it seems like White could have played bishop takes a8 and won the exchange, but he didn't want to because his bishop is better than that rook. That's something I talk to my students about a lot. In theory, a rook is better than a minor piece, but in practice it's not. Okay, it's better in the end game. In the opening and middle game, I'll take the bishop. The rooks, rooks are doing nothing. The, the rooks are totally inactive. Okay, so d4... Rook c8, Georgiev doesn't believe me. He's like, well, I, my, he didn't take my rook. Great. Castles. Knight b8, setting up for the next game. Bishop b7. Bishop b4. And he's like, come on, take my rook so that, you know, I'm not, I don't, there's not this bind on the darks, on the white squares, then black will have the two bishops. And white said, no, g4. Now, I like g4 a lot. And this is something I've talked about in previous lectures and classes and to my private students. Um, the way I assume a lower rated player beats a higher rated player, the most likely way, is the higher rated player blunders. Higher rated players play him better than the lower rated player. Then there's a one move blunder and he loses. Okay, that's an easy way to beat a higher rated player is that's the game they blundered. 
But I like games where the lower rated player takes the play to the opponent and plays super aggressive. White sacks a pawn, white isn't taking the exchange, white plays g4 to attack because the king's on f7. And so he's going to beat his opponent because he's playing better. Not, not because his opponent made some blunder, he's just going to outplay his opponent just like he did with Lyco. Okay, bishop g6, d5 again attacking the opponent, ed, knight takes d5, bishop's attacked on b4, rook e8 attacks the queen, queen is c4, and black's king is just too open. Not only is his rook, his rook's trapped, but now he's got all, he's got all kinds of problems. White has so many threats, I'm confused. So he played rook e4, attacking the queen, so white can't play a discovered check, because black would play rook takes queen. So queen b3 maintains all the threats. Rook takes g4 check, the king slides to h1, and the position's a complete mess, but this diagonal attack, and this bishop attack, and this rook attack, it's all good for white. White's down two pawns, but he should be winning. King f8, he gets the free bishop. c5, goes back to d5. Knight c6. See how the rook is still trapped on c8? Amazing. Knight f4, very serious threat here with knight e6 check. Very serious. So queen d7, queen e6. The end game is completely winning because black's going to lose all of his pieces. If he takes this, knight takes check, and then bishop takes rook, and black is down so many pieces, I don't even know how many he's down. I think he's down a rook and a bishop, although he does have two pawns for it. Okay, so he didn't do that. He played bishop f5. Bishop takes rook. That's a really, this is a really cool configuration. And again, by playing so creatively, Watsu Kobese is taking his opponent out of their comfort zone. Okay, so he took, 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 and now whites up a rook. And just like the last game that he beat Laco, although it was 11 years before this game, uh, his opponent played on way too long. Okay, no respect. So, I mean, whites a rook up, so... No reason to play on. There's no compensation. And then Watsu Kobese kept playing tactics. Okay, bishop takes f6. That's a cool tactic. It doesn't matter. He's up a rook. But now if you take, I take with check, and then I checkmate you. So he's still outplaying his opponent while the guy's not resigning. So he played rook f7. I mean, a6, knight c6, that's insulting. And then another tactic, bishop takes g7, and finally, Georgiev resigned. Uh, if he takes the bishop, rook takes, or you could mouse slip and lose, like me. Oh, wait, if I mouse slip there, I think I'm still winning. No, no, I'm losing. Yeah. Okay, rook takes, king takes, rook d7 check, and takes the bishop. Okay, and this is, and this is silly. So after bishop takes g7, white's threatening knight f6 check, which wins more material. And I have a rook for a pawn, so finally Georgiev resigned. Now I'm going to give Georgiev the benefit of the doubt. This was a team tournament, and you don't resign early in a team tournament. Your team doesn't like that. Okay, you can't be resigning early. You've got to resign late because it's, you know, you're playing for your team. So that's a couple of examples of Kobese beating two super GMs, Kiro Georgiev and Peter Laiko. Pretty good. Okay, let's go to the, the next guy I want to talk about, and that's Daniel Kadri, who I've never heard of, but he was listed by the sponsor as somebody who's really good in South Africa, and he's right, because Kadri is the second best player in South Africa. He's the second highest rated player now. Um, he became an IM in 2014. He's won the South African Championship uh, twice, and he's played for the Olympiad, like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. Uh, he also played in the World Cup, 
were in 2017, and he lost to Levon Aronian in the first round, and Levon won the World Cup that year. So he can say he lost to the winner. And he played in the World Cup last year and lost to uh, Cristobal Enriquez Varagra in the first round. Sorry about my terrible pronunciation. Okay, he's 41, so I don't know much about him because he's 13 years younger than me. Um, but he's the highest rated player we're going to talk about today. And I tried to find, you know, somebody he beat that was very strong. And I did. Although I don't know how this works, so. Okay. And this is against Andre Zhigalko, who's 2,600 feet a. This was in 2014. It looks like it was played in Lille, which is a city in France. And most of you don't know this. Uh, Zhigalko, there's two of them. And they're both 2,600 feet a. And they're brothers. So I think this is the lower rated one. He's only 2,600. That's it. Okay, so this is Cowdery versus Zagalko. Cowdery's white. They played a Sicilian. Bishop E2 is, again, taking your opponent out of their prep. Now we have a Shevenigan. Knight takes C6. That's not going to be any theory. Queen D3. So Zagalko has to play on his own now. Queen g3, it looks like they're pretty aggressive in South Africa. e5, queen e5, black has a ruined pawn structure on the queen side. Knight d5, rook d1 pinning the knight, bishop d6, queen h5, white wants to attack. Knight c3, ruining white's pawn structure. Queen c7, rook d4. So he's not kidding around. If you thought he was kidding around, he's not. If white plays rook h4 here, I think black resigns. Okay, it's black's move, but if it was white's move, rook h4 is completely winning. So he kicked the queen out. Now rook h4 is more winning. So f6, never play f6. Defending on h7. Bishop e3, e5 attacking the rook. Rook goes back. White attacks the bishop on d6. Rook d8. Bishop takes a7. That's a crazy move. Okay, now the queen's defending the bishop and the rook is defending the back rank. So whichever way you take, you're in trouble. If you take with the rook and then take with the rook here, I have queen f8 check and then I can take this rook. Although there might be better, like maybe bishop c4 is better. No, it's not. Okay, now I'm threatening queen f6 check and bishop c4, and I'm up a pawn. Okay, so bishop takes a7 is a crazy tactic. He played c5, trapping the bishop. Bishop f3 attacking the rook. If you play rook takes bishop, it's the same tactic. So he played bishop f8 for a very obvious reason. Always play bishop f8. Bishop takes a8, sacrificing his queen. That's a brilliant move. Now, if you take this, this should be winning. And if you take this, then this is winning. So I, I don't know what he did. But amazing, bishop a7, bishop a8. Very creative play. Okay, he played rook takes a8. Now, black's down the exchange, but this bishop's going to be lost. So then black will have two pieces for a rook. Queen h4, threatening queen f6 with a triple fork. So g5, queen h5. He says, okay, take my bishop. I dare you. I double dare you. And he, he takes it. Rook to d8, threatening rook f8. King g7, h4. So white has a rook for two bishops, but look at black's king and look at black's bishops. Black's bishops are very passive. Black's king is exposed, and all of white's pieces are working in harmony. G4 trapping the white queen. Queen E8, I guess I was wrong. He tried to trap the white queen, but instead it went to the best square. And that has a double attack of both bishops. So queen F7 is forced. Queen C6. 
And this looks very difficult for black. Maybe an engine could defend it. Rook c7, queen e4, the queen does a little dance. c4, that's explosive. I don't understand c4. Rook b1, here comes the other rook to b8. Bishop c5, g3, black wants to play g3, which is crushing because the bishop is, so he stops the counterplay. King h6, running to safety. They move their rooks and bishops. Now if you, if you, if you trade rooks, your bishops attack twice. Um, but if you don't trade rooks, you lose immediately, I think. So he played the move f5, counterattacking the queen. Rook takes c7, double x clam. I think Zhigal called this that. Okay, so I guess he could play rook takes, queen takes, and then like bishop e6, maybe? Although I'm very worried about this king on h6. Also, I'm starting to worry about this past pawn. Not a lot of black pieces to stop that pawn. I even wonder about this end game. I, I wouldn't play queen takes queen, but white's not worse here. That's a pretty strong pawn. Black has no past pawns. Black's king's not in the game. That's probably going to cost black a bishop. Okay, so he blundered with f5. Rook takes c7, double x clam. F takes e4. Rook d... Okay, now white has lots of threats. Some of them are checkmate. Some of them are the queen. If the queen moves to some great square that I don't see, there's this. And so I don't, I don't know what black should do here. This, this looks completely losing. If the queen moves to the back rank, for example, I'll move to the back rank, then rook c6 check and rook takes h7 mate. Um, if the queen moves here, I can check and then check and then I'm going to win your queen. Also, I could take the bishop and win earlier, but this wins your queen because I'm going to force you to play king f5. So that was a brilliant queen sacrifice. And he played bishop takes f2 check. We call that a spite check in the business. King g2, he doesn't want to allow queen f6 check with tempo. So he just says, okay, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to win your queen. You won a pawn. Congratulations. Queen f8. Now, if it's black's move, black is winning with queen uh, f3 check. Now, I remember earlier, about one minute ago, I said, if the queen goes to the back rank, we do this. So I'm assuming that's what he did. Although I think rook h7 might also win. Yeah, rook c6, and Zhigalko resigned. So a brilliant win from Cowdery against very strong grandmaster Zhigalko. If king h5, then this is mate. And in all three games, we see lots of sacrificing and attacking. Okay, now the other very famous player in South Africa is actually their only grandmaster, and his name is Kenny Solomon. And I've heard of him also. Um, he's 44 years old, so getting closer to my age. And he's the only grandmaster South Africa's ever produced. Uh, He's won the South African Championship. He's won the South African Open three times. And he was the top ranked player in South Africa in 2003. And he became an IM in 2004. And he got his final GM norm to become a grandmaster in the Istanbul Olympiad, which we just, just saw a game from. Um, and he qualified for the 2017 World Cup and lost to Fabiano Caruana in the first round. Yeah, when you're a lower-rated player, the first round's tough in the World Cup. Okay, and he's the second grandmaster from sub-Saharan Africa after Aman Samutuwe of Zambia. And according to the article I read, which I don't see now, am I making it up? I thought I read it somewhere. He, he's the fourth black grandmaster I read that, but I don't see it. <clears throat> so maybe I imagined it. And the truth hurts. Oh, it says right here, the fourth black grandmaster in history. So I didn't make it up. Unlike all the other stuff I do, I didn't make that one up. 
Okay, so let's go to Kenny Solomon. Okay, and he's white against Ivan Sokolov, very strong grandmaster in 2011. 2011, that's probably Sokolov's peak. So this would be a great win. It's in an open tournament. I'm not sure where. It says Cento, the Cento Open. So some, somewhere in, in Europe. Okay, knight f3, d4, and we have a Tarash queen's gambit. They play a lot of theory. It's the main line. Okay, I've seen this position many, many, many times. h6, bishop e3. If you want to see good examples of this position, you can look at many games played in the world championship between Karpov and Kasparov. This position probably occurred several times. Bishop g4, put it in h. Queen d Play players just developing their pieces. White defends his h pawn. Knight takes e6. White gets the two bishops. What else? F takes e. A lot of people disagree about whether that's good or bad for white. You're getting the two bishops, but you're fixing black's pawn structure. Now black has two center pawns instead of this weak isolated pawn. Typically, what I learned when I was growing up is when you play knight takes e6, you want to play e4 as quickly as possible and get rid of the black center pawns. So he played rook d1, pinning the pawn. b5, that looks a little weakening to me. Queen c2, rook c8. Queen b1, he's hiding from the black rook. Bishop d6. a3, very slow positional game. Bishop d2, I guess he's ready, he's ready for knight f5 attacking his bishop, and he wants to do what I said, which is to play e4 at some point. Knight h5, now there's tremendous pressure on white's king side. Very dangerous. Some sacrifice could happen. Bishop e1, defending his king side. That's probably why he played bishop d2. Now white's ready to play e4 if necessary. Rook f6, black goes on the attack. Queen d3, this pawn's really defended a lot. The queen, the bishop, the pawn, the king. White's playing great defensive moves. King g1, and then he defends this three times. So now what does black do? Black's played like all the attacking moves, and there's no attack. White still has the two bishops, and white's still going to play e4 at some point. Knight f5, plays e3 instead of my e4. Rook g6, black's definitely going to sacrifice soon. g4, that's an easy move to overlook uh, because it looks like it just opens up the white king. But again, both of these players are super aggressive. I'm not sure if anyone's more aggressive than Ivan Sokolov, but, but Solomon's trying. Knight h4, put it in h. If you take, then you lose your bishop on g2. So he played f4. I like the way he defends against black's attack by attacking. So he plays f4, and he says, my pawns are defended, and they control all these squares, and your pieces can't do anything. Sokolov gets rid of white's two bishops. Queen f7, the rook on g6 was attacked. Knight e2, bringing another piece into the defense. Knight f6. Knight g3, h5, and I think h5 is just a blunder. And that's probably the losing move. I don't think black's losing here, although I don't like black's position. But h5 is too much. g5, black continues with his story and plays h4. Knight e2, the knight comes in and white wins the h4 pawn, and black not only doesn't have compensation for the pawn, black's rook is forever trapped on, on, on g6. It's trapped until it's captured, but it's trapped now. Queen b7, getting on the diagonal of the king. Solomon steps back, king g1, queen b6. He gets out of that again. After queen b7, he probably played king h2 to make sure the queen's never on the same diagonal. King h7, defending his rook, knight g3. And white is mopping up now. Queen e2, 
threatening Queen H5 check. Uh, I don't see a defense <laughs> to Queen H5 check. Yeah, H5, H4 really lost it for black. Rook H8. Ah, always sack the exchange. Very good. Now white doesn't win a whole rook because black takes the bishop on h4 and white's up an exchange and a pawn. Knight h5, threatening checkmate. So we don't have time for rook h3 check. We played rook h3 check anyway. Uh, problem is, if we defend mate, let's say queen b7, that defends mate. Then I play knight f6 check. If you play here, this is checkmate. And if you play here, this will be checkmate soon. Always play bishop f8 and checkmate. So black couldn't see a way to stop the mates. So black sacked the exchange again. He played rook takes h3 check. Now he has to take the knight or he'll get mated. Queen takes. And black is down two exchanges for no pawns. And also white still has a crushing attack. White's threatening queen e8 check, and rook h1, and g6, and black, white's king is perfectly safe. So in this position, Sokolov resigned. So that was an example of three great South African players crushing very strong and or super GMs by playing super aggressive, taking material when they could, and attacking their opponent's king. And... I don't think the sponsor knows this, although I could be wrong, the sponsor might know, I'm guessing he doesn't, that in Africa, the only country I've been to, me, is South Africa. And I was there for the world youth. South Africa was beautiful. We were, we were on the Indian Ocean and we were in a city called Durban, South Africa. And Durban, as you may know, except you don't, has more Indian people than any city in the world that's not in India. They have one million Indian people in Durban, South Africa. And that's, that's the only time I've been to South Africa. I was in Durban being a coach for the U.S. team. And that was, I don't know how long ago it was. I'm going to say eight years ago. It could be nine or ten, but it's, it was a long time ago. Well, that's the lecture on South African players. If you enjoyed this lecture, please like and subscribe, leave a comment. And also, if you want to sponsor a lecture, then contact Karen, Karen at atlchessclub.com. And once again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Christopher Purgage, for sponsoring the lecture. I'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.